but I'm going to talk about another group of organisms that I really like. Um, even though entomologists usually don't study uh, microbes, I'm going to, we're going to talk about fungi um, and a special kind of fungi, fungi that grow in plants and attack insects. So um, this is a really super exciting time because um, we're learning more and more about the organisms that live in soil and what we should do to conserve them. And we're able to do this because um, of technology has allowed us to identify some of these organisms that previously they couldn't be cultured, so we didn't know they were there, and um, we didn't know what they were doing. And so there's a greater and greater appreciation for the biology of systems, like we heard about in the previous talk with insects, but also now especially with um, microbes and microbes in the soil. So this is a, a brief overview of um, what we're going to talk about today. First of all, what's an endophyte, because we like to use jargon and technical terms, so we're going to just talk about what endophyte is and what they do. And then um, I'm going to talk about an endophyte that you may be really familiar with, and then I'm going to go on to talk about one that you've probably never heard about before, which is a fungus called metarhizium that's very common in agricultural soils. And I'm sorry I'm turning my back on you. <laughs> um, and so then I want to talk about um, what we are learning about how crop management affects these um, fungi, crops and cover crops, soil properties, uh, disturbances like tillage, and also pesticides. And then we'll just wrap that all up. Okay, so what's a an endophyte? Um, usually when we think about microbes in uh, agricultural systems, we think of plant pathogens maybe, like bacteria, fungi, viruses that infect plants and cause plant disease. However, there's a lot of beneficial microbes out there, and I know you, you're familiar with like rhizobium that um, helps legumes uh, uh, fix nitrogen, but there are also a lot of other organisms that live um, symbiotically or together in very close association with plants. and. Uh, most of those are bacteria and fungi, and they grow in plants and, and in plant tissues without causing any plant disease. And all plants that have been studied to date harbor some kind of uh, microbial community within the plant body, in the roots and the stems and the leaves. And, and we're just getting to appreciate that more and more. And it's, challenging our, idea, our ideas about how we think about plants. We, we're used to thinking about plants as individual organisms, but really they're a community of organisms. And how can we take advantage of that knowledge to um, help us grow uh, more productive crops with fewer inputs? Okay, so they're potentially very uh, important, but it's only recently that we're really understanding how to study them, and we have the technologies to do that now. Um, and so only a very few of these uh, endophytes have been fully characterized, but we know there are a lot out there. Okay, and so any single plant tissue, be it root, leaf, stem, um, can harbor many different species all at the same time. And some of those up on the, um, uh, the photos are ones you might have at least heard about before, like... Um, the uh, fescue endophytes or bluegrass endophytes um, that um, protect those plants from insects and help those plants be hardy. Mycorrhizae, everybody's heard about mycorrhizae, right? Those are endophytes that live in association with roots and have lots of uh, great um, benefits for us. And then there are other endophytes that grow in the leaves. And you can see on that, uh, the far end picture, the fungi that are growing out of that leaf. That's an endophyte, not a, a disease-causing organism. Okay, and so I apologize for the small uh, writing on these, these uh, slides, but this was just from a, a, a scientific paper where the, the researchers, they looked at what endophytes, what uh, fungal uh, organisms could they pull out of these plants, and they were looking at uh, corn and at rice, and you can see the great list of organisms that they pulled out of different parts of these plants. And you might be able to see that um, on the 
right side, there are some that are just called EN something. That's because those are organisms that we previously didn't know exist and we don't know what they are. So they just labeled them EN for endophyte, right? And so they're characterizing those. But it shows that all of these organisms are living in plants. Um, some are probably neutral, some are beneficial. Um, these were not um, plant disease causing organisms, but they were living in those plants. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of these endophytes to plants? And so, first of all, for those um, fungi, where I'm going to focus on the fungi, <clears throat> the benefits, you know, uh, to, to, to a fungus living in a plant, well, it gets to eat. It gets a free home and a free meal, right? So plants, you know, photosynthesize. They use sunlight and carbon dioxide and water to produce sugars. And a lot of those sugars are transferred down to the roots, and so much of that sugar is going down to those roots, it can't keep it all, and it's just exuding out of the roots all the time, and it's feeding lots of microorganisms in the soil. So um, those fungi that are living in and around the roots are, are taking advantage of all those sugars and other nutrients um, uh, like nitrogen and sulfur that those plants are exuding. And those plants are then feeding these microorganisms. And so uh, those uh, endophytes and the, root ri the rhizosphere associates get like a free meal. And, but in return, they're doing things for the plants, right? And so this is a picture of uh, mycorrhizae, and we all know that mycorrhizae grow out of the plant roots and they extend the root volume to much greater um, to the actual root volume of the plant. And so it helps by having a greater root volume, the plant is able to gather more water and nutrients from the soil, from that volume of soil that's being taken advantage of. And that increases the overall hardiness of plants, helps it uh, survive stresses better than uh, plants that don't have mycorrhizae, and it helps it uptake minerals, especially phosphorus, nitrogen, zinc, and uh, magnesium, and increases the nitrogen use efficiency of those plants that are mycorrhizal. That's a particular kind of endophyte. Okay, and also we know that these endophytes can enhance the plant's tolerance or resistance to uh, plant disease and also to insect plants. That's why we have a lot of uh, these uh, fescues and other grazing pasture uh, grasses that are endophytic because they're resistant to uh, insects. And so the way they do that is these fungi, in, in cooperation with the plant, produce chemicals that inhibit the growth of other organisms or um, they turn on the uh, defenses of the plants. Plants have an immune system. It's different than ours. Um, but it, the, the interaction of the plant and the fungus um, results in that plant immune system being sort of uh, charged up and helps it resist plants, uh, plant pests and plant pathogens. Okay, so we, I want to start with this uh, a really quick summary of things you probably already know about mycorrhizae because it's a commonly known one and the fungus I'm going to focus on after this, it has some interesting similarities but it also has some differences from this. And, and mycorrhizae are probably the most abundant uh, fungi in agricultural soils bet between 5 and 50 percent of that microbial biomass in soil, fungal biomass. And again, it, uh, the benefits to the fungus, it's growing on those roots, it's taking advantage of all those excess sugars that the plants are making. And um, the benefit to the host plant, again, is this expanded root volume and taking up uh, nutrients from the soil and feeding the plant, especially with phosphorus and zinc. And again, it's, it has been associated with increased disease, plant disease and insect pest. Um, uh, tolerance to those or resistance, and it, it helps with the water relations in the plant. Benefits to this, this is an interesting endophyte because it grows out of the plant into the soil and it helps stabilize soil aggregates and contributes to um, soil carbon. So, and you know, we're all interested in building up our soil carbon. And so this is just a cartoon 
of how it, um, how the, the fungal, the, it's called fungal hyphae, the little strands of fungus, knit together the soil aggregates and help hold the um, aggregates together. And also, the fun not only do roots have exudates, these fungi also have exudates. And the exudates from this, uh, from mycorrhizal fungi is called glomalin, and it's like a glue. And so it helps glue those soil aggregates together. And what's great about soil aggregates? You guys should all know this. Right, it makes your soil structure good. It makes it resistant to erosion. So we really want our soil to be well aggregated so we get lots of good water and air infiltration. So our soil's like a sponge. Okay, so that's what's really great about mycorrhizae. So some, we know a lot of mycorrhizae have been studied for a long time, right? We know um, that uh, there are practices that are both beneficial and some that are detrimental to mycorrhizae. And so if we want to promote mycorrhizae in our crop fields, we want to include a perennial crop like a hay crop in our rotation um, because that's not disturbed, right, for like two, three, four years. Um, we want to make sure that there, our rotations include a host crop. So there are some crops that won't host mycorrhizae, like buckwheat, um, like brassicas, canola, tillage, radish, <clears throat> will not host mycorrhizae. We want living roots there all the time. And so we want to use overwintering cover crops. Where we can, we want to reduce tillage. This is the conservation <laughs> tillage meeting, so you guys are probably good there. And um, we don't um, want to use excessive phosphorus because phosphorus, these fungi are really involved in phosphorus relations and it does cost the plant some sugar to host these mycorrhizae. And if phosphorus is already um, in excess, um, it's not worth it to the plant to host these fungi. And so excess phosphorus will um, be detrimental to uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, so that's where I start the detrimental practices, high uh, fertility uh, inputs, especially phosphorus. Um, as we heard about in the um, previous talk, pesticides in general, some of them are damaging, and of course it's a fungus, so we would expect fungicides would not promote <laughs> um, good populations of these beneficial fungi in soil. Frequent inversion tillage, because these hyphae are growing in the soil, when we till them, till we break them up and we break up the roots that are supporting these fungi, and so we um, decrease populations um, where there's a, a lot of excessive uh, inversion tillage, long bare fallow, again, because they need living roots. And uh, non-host crops are detrimental, right? Like brassicas and buckwheat, I already mentioned that. Okay, so, so that's a fungus, an endophytic fungus you guys are already probably really familiar with. And so in the last 10 years, I'd say or so, we've made some discoveries about some other fungi that were really su um, surprising. So. We've known a long time, <clears throat> entomologists have for a long time studied insect pathogenic fungi. These are fungi that infect insects and kill them. And so we've been working on them as a, a biological control agents and looking at how to conserve these fungi to suppress pests in uh, fields. And um, about 10 years ago or so, so these are, those have been studied for hundreds of years, just insect pathogenic fungi. About 10 years ago, and maybe a little more, it turned out that some of these fungi, especially the ones that live in soil, also grow in plants. So they grow in insects and they grow in plants. So the first discovery of this was in the late 80s at Iowa State. Uh, Les Lewis, he works on, a lot on uh, no-till corn back in the 80s. He might, he's probably retired now. And they found that this fungus, this white one, that white, those are all uh, pictures of insects up there that are infected with fungi. That white fuzzy one, <laughs> that, that was a caterpillar. 
and it's infected with a fungus called Bovaria bassiana. And Les Lewis and his group in, at Iowa State found out that this, they found this fungus growing inside of corn and it was killing European corn borer in, um, in corn. And uh, when he came out with that, like no one believed him. They thought, oh my gosh, this guy's crazy, right? No one believed him for a really long time because he did this back in the 80s and it's just now that we're starting to understand that yes, this is a real phenomenon. And so um, since that time, more and more people have been studying these fungi that infect both insects and uh, plants. And so more recently, since in about 2012, it was discovered that this fungus metarhizium that I'm gonna focus on, that's the green one that's right in the middle, green fungus, um, colonizes both the rhizosphere of plants and also can grow, in, infect into the roots and grow throughout the whole plant. And these fungi, both Bovaria and metarhizium, have been studied a long time. In fact, you can get a commercial formulation. Um, in the case of metarhizium, there's a product called Met52, and uh, Bovaria bassiana is Mycotrol. So, you know, these fungi have been, we've understood them as insect pathogens for a long time. Okay, so these are sometimes called entomopathogenic fungi. Entomo means insect, pathogenic means causing disease. And so that's a fungus that parasitizes insects in that top uh, picture, the white fuzzy one is Bovaria, and that used to be an insect. You can see it's parasitized the insect and it's sporulating and it's growing out into the soil, right? <coughs> and so we commonly isolate Bovaria and, um, excuse me, <coughs> and metarhizium, the green one on the bottom from the soil. However, they're not like uniform through the soil, right? They're very spatially and temporally sort of patchy. They have a patchy distribution in space and time. And the reason for that is, so if you have an infected insect and it's making all these spores, those spores can't really move on their own inside of the soil. So that would all be happening in the soil. And you know, fungi don't have legs, they can't get up and walk away. And so what you do is you get these clumps of fungal spores that used to be infected insects. And so they're all clumped up there and wherever the infected insect was. And so that's why they have a very patchy distribution. Okay, so this is how they work. Um, if we start with that top cartoon, a fungal spore comes into contact with the insect in the soil or on the soil surface, or this is the same thing that happens above ground on plants, and that spore germinates, and the fungus starts to grow in the body of the insect, where it proliferates. And after it uses up all the resources in that uh, insect body, special forms of the fungus grow out of the body again and make those spores, which results in those pictures I showed you of all the, the big fuzzy green or the big fuzzy white or pink uh, insect that was infected. And on that bottom little diagram with the arrows shows going from a healthy larva through the different stages of how that larva looks after it's infected until the end when it's the end of the life cycle of the fungus is when it breaks out of the insect and sporulates. And so what's really interesting, the way we can tell that a fungus is infected before it gets all fuzzy like that, is an infected insect, usually you think of a dead thing of being gooey and smelly, right? Well, when the um, insect is infected with this fungus, it doesn't turn all gooey and slimy. It stays very firm. In fact, it feels kind of like your earlobe. <laughs> so, so that's how we tell if it's infected with a fungus before it uh, sporulates as we kind of feel that insect larva and see if it feels like an eraser or your earlobe. Okay, so these fungi um, and these entomopathogenic endophytic fungi and non-entomopathic endophytes can affect insects directly or indirectly, and an example of the non-entomopathogenic endophyte is the mycorrhiza. 
So we can look at those columns and we can see that those insect pathogens that are also endophytes have all these suppressive effects on different characteristics of insect life cycles, on their abundance, on their reproductive rate, the larval survival, larval weight, the amount of plants that they eat, and their choice of insect plants. Whereas the, end, the mycorrhizal fungi, they have some uh, negative effects on some of those insect characteristics, but sometimes they don't really have a plus or minus effect. And in fact, for some insects, they can increase um, the insects, but, well, they can affect the insect behavior so that it, it prefers those mycorrhizal uh, plants. And it, it kind of the effect depends on what kind of insect it is. You know, um, different insects feed in different ways. We have chewing insects, sucking insects, mining insects, galling insects. And the entomopathogenic fungi that are endophytes um, suppress all of those, whereas really the mycorrhizal fungi are most effective against the sucking insects like aphids and uh, plant feeding bugs, the true bugs. Okay, so this fungus, Metarhizium, is super common all over the world. There are only nine species, but it belongs to a group of fungi that do a lot of different things. There are these plant symbionts, there's insect pathogens in that group, and there are, patho there are fungi that attack other fungi in that group. But the, most, the thing we're most interested about are some of the species can form these endophytic relationships with plants. Okay, so that bottom pink circle is sort of that path insect pathogenic or parasitic life cycle that I just talked about, but it also grows in association with plant roots and in plants. Can also, it's pretty easy to grow this stuff in a lab on a defined medium, and so we think it also grows that saprophytic cycle at the top left, it represents that it can grow on organic matter in the soil. So we don't know less about that than about this uh, plant growth phase and the insect phase. What's really interesting, why people are really interested in this fungus now, is because it's been found from that infected insect in the soil it can grow out from that insect and it can infect plant roots and it transfers nitrogen from that dead insect into the plant. So it's probably involved in some kind of nutrient cycling or potentially in nutrient cycling. We have no idea how important this is in nature. This is a phenomenon that's been uh, just, br it's not well studied yet. People are working on this, but it definitely, Nitrogen from those uh, infected insects ends up in the plants. And carbon from those infected plants and ends up in the fungus. So there's definitely some nutrient cycling and trading going on there. Okay, so multifunctional. It has a, this fungus, we're understanding now, Metarhizium, has a lot of functions. And there are probably many other fungi that we don't know about that are doing the same thing in our fields. So it's an insect pathogen, it colonizes the root zones and it can grow into the plant. It promotes the growth of those plants that are infected and it suppresses the growth of um, insects that feed on those plants. Whoops, I need to go back. And it's been shown in laboratory and greenhouse. We don't have any field results yet that it can um, suppress plant disease, and then it's also involved in these nutrient uh, transfers. And so this picture just shows a corn plant, and we've taken um, little pieces of the leaf, and we put them on, surface sterilize them, and put them on the plates, and you can see that fungus growing out of the plants. And this, that's when we grow the corn plants, when we treat the seeds with the spores of this fungus. We just soak the seeds in the spores, we plant them, and then we come back and we take little pieces of the plant and see if we can find the fungus in the plant, and we do. Okay, so, um, and this is a, a, someone else's work, but it just shows how, it's a big plant, little plant <laughs> picture, where you're growing these little seedlings in this tray without metarhizium, that's what they look like on the left. <laughs> 
And on the right, you can see that the root volume and the size of those plants is much greater in the presence of this fungus. And so the way we study these things, you could study these things, because we're using, we're taking soil samples. Who fishes? Who uses waxworms for fishing bait? Anybody? We get waxworms and we put waxworms in our soil samples. Waxworms, it turns out, are super susceptible to insect um, pathogens in the soil because where are waxworms in nature? They're in beehives. They're never, they have no evolutionary history with the soil. So they're super susceptible. So we use them sort of as a sentinel to tell us. It's like the canary in the coal mine. If we put, we can put those waxworms in the soil and they they see a pathogen and they die and get infected, okay? So that's how we get those pictures of those fuzzy insects. Um, and then we culture the fungus from those infected insects and then we can identify them with molecular means. And then we can use them in experiments and that's what that little jar is there. There we're just soaking the seed. We're, putting some with the spores, with the fungal spores, and then we can use those seed to grow plants, in our case, corn plants. And then we can do all sorts of experiments with those corn plants, and we can look at how it affects uh, plant growth and the plant defense system, what the, uh, what the um, fungus is doing actually to the plant. And we can look at how insects react to those plants that are infected too. Okay, <clears throat> so when we soak the seeds, when we expose the seeds to that fungus and grow plants from those, we get 91% infected plants. So the, this fungus is happy to grow in corn and corn is happy to host this fungus. 91% of the plants that we treat become infected. And we're, we're exposing the seed and so even though we're exposing the seed, we can look at where in the plant it gets infected, and it can be in just the leaf, just the root, or both the leaf and root. And the vast majority, it's that fungus from exposure in the seed, when the seed germinates and the plant grows, the fungus is in the whole plant. So it somehow grows up with the plant and is in the stem and leaf too. Okay, so on this graph, so we categorized those plants. So we treated the seed, we grew the plant, so we exposed the seed, and then we detected it again in the plant that's exposed and detected, or we couldn't find the fungus again. So that's a, we exposed it, but then we couldn't find the fungus again. And that was only in like eight or 9% of our plants. And then the control is we just soaked the seed and planted it, but we didn't expose it to the fungus. And you can see that the bar for the exposed and detected, that's where we exposed the plant and then we found the fungus again. The, the plant height at V4 is significantly taller than the control plants and sort of the ones that we exposed but we couldn't find the fungus again are sort of in the middle and I think that that's because it's a combination of plants where there actually was no infection or the infection was too low for us to be able to find it. And so the, both the above ground dry biomass and the height of the plants grown are greater. So it's promoting the growth of those plants that were exposed. So then we do feeding tests with, we're using black cutworm to see the effect of um, this fungus in the plant on insect feeding. <clears throat> and so this is a growth rate just over a very short time of black cutworm. We put the black cutworm on uh, the plant tissue that has been treated or the control, and again, it's the, the plants that were exposed and we could find the fungus again, the plants that were exposed but we couldn't find the fungus again, or the control, they weren't treated. And you can see that the growth rate on those plants that were exposed and then we could find the fungus again was the lowest, so it slows down the growth of the insects. It didn't kill them because we're just looking at that over like three days. But the importance of this is there's this sort of slow growth hypothesis and it really relates to the previous talk. The slower insect grows, the longer the time 
that it's exposed in the environment to natural enemies. So it, it's been hypothesized and shown that if an insect is growing slowly, it's more likely to be eaten by one of these predators or parasitized by a parasite because it's in the environment longer. So, so even though this fungus that's growing in the plant may not outright kill the insect, it's slowing its growth and it makes it more likely that that insect will be killed by a natural enemy. Okay, so besides lab and greenhouse tests, we do lots of work in the field, and that's how I even found this fungus for years and years, like 20 years I've just been, I'm a soil entomologist, so looking at stuff in the soil, and we find these fu fungal infected insects, and yeah, that's interesting, and we keep data on that and everything, but we never really thought about it in relation to the plant until someone discovered that it was growing in the plant, then we got very interested in that. And so most of our research um, has to do, I work in organic systems, has to do with reduction of tillage in organic systems and use of co winter cover crops in those systems. And the cover crop research is very relevant to any kind of uh, production system. <clears throat> and so we mostly work on you know, how to fit uh, cover crops into uh, rotations, uh, field crop rotations, and also looking at monocultures versus polycultures. Um, and so in, over time, what we've um, noticed is that we find more of this fungus in the soil. And this is a rotation we typically use as a corn, soy, small grain, not always wheat, sometimes spelt. Um, we find greater infection of insects from that soil where we have had corn than soy or wheat. And so that's kind of interesting. So there's something that those plants do, either the management or the plant itself. Some favor the fungus more than others. Oops. Okay. Yeah. So there's a crop species effect on, because we're interested in conserving this fungus, right? We think, that, yeah, this fungus is a good thing to have. What, what, what affects the amount of this fungus that's in the soil? And so another thing that favors this fungus, and is kind of related maybe to the fact that this fungus may grow on organic matter, is where we have active carbon, um, we have more of this fungus. And you know that there are different pools of carbon and organic matter. All this organic matter, woo, I'm going to fall down there, starts out as fresh residue, right? Crop residue, roots, stems, leaves. And so when the plants are harvested, that leaves a lot of residue on the ground, or your cover crops, maybe you're managing them, there's a lot of residue on the ground, um, and then there's also living organisms. So that's your like live, rec live uh, or recently dead pool of organic matter. And that is converted by organisms into this decomposing organic matter, which is called the active fraction. And it's active because decomposers are actively working on it. It has, still has lots of good stuff, easily digestible, and so it's really supporting your soil biology. And so that's the, we really want to keep pumping in those uh, plant residues and manures and composts to keep that active fraction up because that's what's supporting our soil biology. And where we have that high active fraction, we have more of these particular fungi. Eventually, as that active fraction of the um, organic matter, that pool is broken down, all the de easily digested stuff is taken out of, that organic matter comes, becomes part of the stabilized organic matter, which is great for the soil physical properties, but not so important for the soil biology. But it's still important to have it there so that your soil's like a sponge, right? It's really important in water relations and in um, keeping your soil from becoming compacted. Okay, and so we think that this metarhizium may be persistent on this decomposing persisting on this decomposing organic matter or even growing on the organic matter. And we also know just in support of that is they might actually be an important part of this conversion product or conversion process um, of this decomposing active fraction moving into the stabilized um, uh, organic fraction 
And it turns out that mycorrhizae may also be, doing, be important for this. Mycorrhizae may also um, be important in that decomposition um, and carbon stabilization cycle. Okay, another thing that supports, we find a positive relationship between metarhizium and um, uh, soil factors in the cash crops is electrical conductivity. So where you have, um, so as electrical conductivity increases, um, we get increasing um, abundance of this fungus, and that electrical conductivity sort of indicates a lot of different things about your soil. Um, it correlates with a lot of different properties, can be an integrator of many different characteristics, your soil texture, your cation exchange capacity, the water holding capacity, and organic matter level. All of those are higher, uh, uh, increase your, with electrical, as electrical conductivity increases with the increase of those properties. And we also know that that's also positive for mycorrhizal fungi. And this little graph at the bottom just shows that just naturally, as your clay content increases, you have an increase in electrical conductivity because clays, as you know, can um, hold a lot more charge, uh, charged particles and have increased cation exchange capacity. And so and as, as you move away from the sandy soils to the clay soils, you get greater um, conservation of metarhizium, but also of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, so the other thing we're working with, um, as I mentioned, were these winter cover crop cocktails, and we're really focusing on six different cover crops grown alone or in combination um, to see what kind of effects they have on the system on many different aspects of the system, but I'm just going to tell you about the metarhizium. And so what we find, you know, usually we do think of diversity as being super important, and I'm not saying that it's not. This is just about this particular fungus, because I do think diversity is important, but for this, for this fungus, it doesn't care if there's diversity or not. What it cares about and this is where it goes from left to right. You can see at P is where we find the greatest percentage of this metarhizium, goes all the way down to canola, where we find the lowest. So that's kind of what I would also expect with my, uh, mycorrhizae, right? We would expect low levels where we have a brassica. And these are um, all the different mixtures. You can see the mixtures, four, three, seven, six species, all mixed in with the monocultures. It doesn't care if it's mixed or not. It just cares what particular kind of plant it is. We get greater abundance of this uh, fungus in legumes, cover crops, compared to brassicas. And everything else is kind of in the middle. So all of our different cover crop mixture treatments, not. Uh, not significant, doesn't care if it's a monoculture or a mixture, but what it cares about is the proportion of brassicas. Is the greater proportion of brassicas, the less of this fungus we find. Okay, and interestingly, also the proportion of cereal rye in the spring is negatively re related to this fungus, and we're not sure why that is, because mycorrhizal fungi really like cereal rye. But this particular fungus doesn't seem to like cereal rye. So the greater, when we have a mixture, the more cereal rye we have in it, the less fungus we find in it. Weeds. Weeds are pretty diverse, right? If we're in an organic system, if you don't have something growing there, you've got weeds, right? Okay. So, so we detect less. <clears throat> of this fungus in brassicas than in legumes and a negative correlation with the proportion of cereal rye and why that might be. And the more we understand about these microbes in the soil, we know that plants actually, and this relates back to the uh, corn, certain plants, they can choose, they kind of, they drive what the microbe community is that's there. It's plants that are driving that. And so the kind of plant you're growing has a big effect on the microbial community. And so in this negative effect of brassicas, that's really kind of supported by what other people have found with other organisms. It's very consistent, and if you guys have ever heard about like using brassicas or mustard, 
propagate soil naturally. You know, it's pretty antimicrobial. So we don't want to grow brassica, 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 brassica. I mean, you know, none of this thing, these things are going to disappear completely, but we're talking about what's kind of suppressive to these organisms and what will promote them. Okay, and so people have had some lab exper experiments in the past that also indicate that the compounds associated, they're called glucosinolates, that are um, associated with uh, brassica roots are suppressive to metarhizium. And so we're wondering, you know, uh, rye, cereal rye has a lot of allelochemicals, in this case uh, compounds called benzoxazenoids. They also may uh, interact negatively with that fungus, where they don't with the mycorrhizal. The, the mycorrhizal, again, like cereal rye. But they may be negatively associated. We're just setting up some experiments now to test that. Okay, and so now in the, that was in the cash crops, and in the cover crops, specifically, the, the characteristics of those cover crops, besides being, having legumes there, that um, are positively associated with this fungus is good fall cover crop biomass. And we like good fall cover crop biomass for a lot of reasons, right? But here's another reason, is that it's positively associated with the amount of this fungus in the soil. Springweed biomass, <laughs> you guys might not like that, but that's why it may be sur surviving in those fallow systems. It's where we had higher springweed biomass. It's an early season resource in those bare fallows. And so, right, living roots. I don't care what roots they are, right, for soil biology, just like those insects don't care what other <laughs> insects, if they're pests or beneficial, they're going to eat them. Everybody's hungry out there all the time. Soil moisture, well, fungus, you think about fungus, what does fungus need? It needs some moisture, right? It needs some moisture for growth, germination of spores, making spores. And silt and clay, the percentage of silt and clay is, is that increases, not to the extreme. <laughs> but um, I think that's related to the moisture. You know, you have a, a loamier or a little bit heavier soil, it tends to hold water, and soil moisture is good for these fungi. The surprising one we found was soil calcium. We had a really, pot, that's that graph on the bottom, a positive relationship with the amount of soil calcium in our soil tests. And fungi in general, there's a relationship between uh, endophytic fungi in general with fungi. And calcium's a really important um, uh, nutrient for fungi. It's required for them to make spores, to germinate to grow the little hyphae and to branch. So we know that fungi in general. And another thing that is interesting about fungi is, so I don't know if the calcium's promoting the fungus or if the fungus is promoting the calcium. Because fungi, all fungi, produce a compounds called oxalates and they're acids and they can break down uh, some of these recalcitrant nutrients and make them available. And so these oxalate solubilized nutrients, um, and that requires the presence of calcium, but it's been shown in experiments that calcium, <clears throat> that these oxalates can solubilize really insoluble compounds like calcium phosphate. And that was not done in the field, it was done in a in, in a lab, um, but when you grow, when you just use calcium phosphate, the calcium's released from that, and they, um, some people have showed, researchers have showed that when they grew wheat seedlings, where they had the soil treated with metarhizium, it grew faster, and they ac um, accounted, what they, the way they accounted for that was that it was because it was solubilizing this recalcitrant calcium and helping feed the plants. So that's something interesting that needs more research. So negative uh, relationships. We don't have highly sandy soils. We mostly have clay loams, loams, sand, well, silt loams. Um, but even within those soil classes, we find that the greater the sand content, um, there's a negative relationship with these fungi. And I think that's because of the water relations, that they, those sandy soils don't hold uh, moisture as well, and so 
these fungi need moisture. Also, the number of days since disturbance. Well, that's kind of weird, right? You'd think, oh, if you had disturbed soil, you'd be knocking down the populations of this stuff. But you have to remember, okay, unlike mycorrhizae, which grow as hyphae, as these strands throughout the soil, they're really chopped up when you disturb the soil. But these fungi, they're spores in the soil. And so they just sit there. So they need some soil mixing to spread them around, right? And so where you have like a long time since disturbance, I think you develop a really patchy distribution of these and it's harder to find something that's like clumped. Like if you guys were all sitting over there and I looked for you over here, I wouldn't be able to find you even though you were the same number of people. Okay. So, you know, we have this whole range of practices that vary in the amount of disturbance, soil disturbance we have. And in general, you know, I, I'm not advocating for like a lot of tillage, but there are organisms, there are organisms that are adapted to disturbance and there are, at the other end, there are organisms adapted to not disturbance and there's pest and beneficials that will take advantage of any conditions that you provide them, whether they be at the far end where you're mold bore plowing or the other end where you're no tilling. You know, there's some organisms, it's wonderful, there's some organisms that are adapted to everything on each end and in between. Okay, so it just depends on what organism you're talking about. So this particular organism, Metarhizium, so the solid bars, show the amount of fungus we find in a full tillage system, moldboard plow, okay? And um, the little dotted bars show how much we find in a mil minimum till. And the way we in this project were describing minimum till was a chisel plow and disc at the beginning of the season. So you can see that we find a little bit more where we're using the chisel plow and disc I mean, the moldboard plow than where we're using the chisel plow and disc. And another, uh, some other researchers in Iowa, they compared where they find this fungus in its systems that use a chisel plow versus no-till. And you can see there's less in the no-till, and I don't think there's actually less. I think it's just all more clumped together. It's not mixed into the soil well because there was no soil disturbance to spread it around. Okay, so we did this little thing in organic systems. We have a lot of disturbance. This is all kinds of disturbances, planting, whatever, harvest, cultivation, because we are working to reduce tillage by using rolled cover crops and using that system. And we kind of find this loose uh, um, relationship between the number of disturbances and it seems like a little bit of disturbance so when a line is curved like that that means there's at some point you find the highest at the one end where there's no disturbances we find less and at the other end where we have the maximum amount of disturbances we find less and there's like the happy medium in between and for us that was between eight and ten disturbances in a year a full year not the growing season so and that includes harvesting rolling soil management, weed culti you know, cultivation. So you can see that it kind of likes a little bit of disturbance, this particular fungus. Not every fungus probably does, but as I said, there's organisms that are adapted to all different conditions, beneficial and pest organisms. Okay, pesticides. Um, in the previous talk, we, he mentioned this. Of course, there's a lot of fungicides that are detrimental to fungi. <laughs> They're fungicides, right? They're meant to kill fungi. So th these are from three different studies. We haven't really looked at this a lot um, with the chemicals, but there are definitely fungicides that are suppressive to this fungus and to mycorrhizal fungi. But surprisingly, are there are also herbicides that are detrimental and insecticides that are detrimental. And our previous speaker told us why that might be is because a lot of these compounds have multiple effects in the environment or they have multiple sort of modes of actions and they're better at one thing than the other, so they're sold as fungicides instead of insecticides. Okay, and so when we're using our, like our technology packages with the treated seed, 
We want to kind of be conscious of, I mean, we're becoming more conscious. And um, there are companies now that are making biological seed treatments to replace some of these um, chemical seed treatments. All right. Okay. And, you know, in organic, we're not pure. <laughs> There are also pesticides used in organic systems that are suppressive to fungi, right? And uh, some of these are specifically the biologicals that are parasites of fungi that are meant to control plant disease. Some of those, of course, also attack other fungi besides plant pathogens. Um, neem is commonly used in organic systems. That's also suppressive to this fun fungus. Spinosad, which is uh, available in both organic and conventional versions, is compatible with metarhizium, so yay. <laughs> okay, so a summary for management and conservation. Rotation, because endophytes like some crops better than others, so I say mix it up, right? Give them different stuff. Um, they tended to like corn, but I'm not promoting after corn. Um, winter cover crops can help conserve them, and that's again because they're living roots. Um, there's this interesting relationship, though, between brassicas and cereal rye. I'm not saying don't grow those. I'm saying don't grow them all, every time. Mix it up. Have some diversity. Just like a lot of things, just like our plants, they like <laughs> soils with good fertility, moisture holding capacity, and active organic matter. A little tillage is okay. It spreads around the spores. Um, some pesticides are suppressive, so we just have to be conscious of that. We're still learning more about that. Um, and in general, you know, these endophytes, they're common and they're beneficial. So we really need to learn more and understand how to use them. And if we can l learn how to harness them, how to conserve them, like, reliably and effectively, it could potentially reduce our need for fertility and pest management inputs and make our um, crops better able to withstand environmental stresses. Um, we're still learning, you know, about what management practices uh, really can um, promote these or that are detrimental. Um, and so by doing this research, I think we can learn more about um, how to suppress pests and promote plant health, especially in our, in, with our changing climate. Okay, so these are, I just have to acknowledge my funders. USDA, thank you very much. <laughs> and these projects have had a lot of people working on them, and those ones in bold are the ones that are really focused on this fungal work.